the fifth quality, the fifth and final quality, is morality or manners. We all know that Islam has a great stress on manners, of good character. And the Prophet Muhammad himself, one of the reasons he was sent was to, uh, was to perfect those, those good character. The hadith says, I was, indeed I was sent to perfect the good character traits. And Allah also said about the Prophet Muhammad in Surah Al-Qalam, Indeed you are of magnificent character. So, to have good manners. And this kind of touches on what I just mentioned, as in not being arrogant when you're speaking to people, not when they reply to you, not laughing as if, as if you know, you're ever so knowledgeable and they have. So that's also important. A couple of uh, other points during da'wah, uh, which I kind of put together, is listen before you speak. Meaning, don't assume because a, per a person is from a certain nationality or a certain country that you must know what they believe. Always try, if you get the chance to have some kind of dialogue, try and find out what they believe first, because you can waste five or ten minutes going into the Trinity and saying how Jesus can't be the Son of God without letting them even reply to you and you find out this person doesn't even believe that. And that is the, that is the case, excuse me, my, that is the case many a time that the people, many people who you assume who believe in a certain thing don't actually believe in that thing. So that's important. And another thing is put yourself in the other person's shoes. Whatever you're saying to them, make it simple and understandable to them. Like I touched on earlier, you try to judge the person you're speaking to when you're giving them dawah. So if the person's, a, a, like I said, a simple person, then don't come into very complex, detailed language with them. Keep it simple. If the person is more scholastic, then yes, you can you know, tackle it from that angle. Now, coming towards the end as such, we look at the ways, the focus of giving dawah, what should the focus of dawah be, and ways of giving dawah. Uh, and I'd like to remind us all really that many of us probably have non-Muslim colleagues, maybe non-Muslim family, maybe non-Muslim friends, uh, maybe even fellow students in Preston. And this goes to myself first and then to everybody else. It is very vital that we give this message in whatever way we can. If you can get hold of a book, if you're a shy person who feels like I'm not a scholar, and I'm not a person who is very, very, you know, upfront. At least give, you know, you've got a friend next to you at work, just pass them an Islamic book. That's the very, very least, and maybe then you'll be fulfilling your obligation. Because on the, or well, we don't realise, or well, maybe sometimes we don't realise, on, on the day of judgment, every work colleague, every family member, every, everybody you came in contact with, when Allah asked them why they did not become Muslim on the day of judgment, they will say, such and such used to live, was my neighbour. He never gave me any, any dawah. Such and such was my colleague at Preston University, for example. He never gave, he never told me the message of Islam. So that's very important to make sure that every opportunity we get to give dawah, whatever it may be, maybe you can just mention, maybe a person's going through a hardship or something in their life, you can mention a hadith that's regarding that. Maybe that you can give them a hadith about patience. That could be enough to say to themselves, well, that, that man, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he sounds, uh, that sounded really like, uh, really spiritual. Let me look into the message of Muhammad, or let me read about, you know, Prophet, Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad's uh, uh, life story. So for the focus of Dao, the main focus should be Tawheed. Many people delve into comparative religion, and they will spend all their time reading comparative religion, and the only way they like to give Dao is by quoting verses from the Bible to try and prove that Islam is right by the Bible. And we all know that the Bible is no longer an authentic revelation from Allah. So to use the Bible solely to try and explain to them, because they can just come back to you and say to you, okay, you, you proved to me in the Bible that God is one, but there's another person part in the Bible where God is wrestling with Jacob and Jacob is throwing God on the floor. So, you know, it's, it's important to learn comparative religion to some extent, but the main focus has to be on the oneness of Allah how logically Allah can only be one. And yes, you can get into the whole textual things. It, it's, it's a good angle to come from when you mention how the Bible historically has changed, not just Muslim propaganda. Historically, it's proven that the, the Bible has changed over time, and this is no longer the true message that came, for, that came from Jesus. So it's good to study from that aspect, and you can bring in from that side 
we can mention that the Quran is the only religious text in the history of the world that is as it is today. And even the Orientalist scholars who study this, they hold their hands up high and say that the Quran that they have today is the Quran that was put together by Abu Bakr in the time of the, and the other companions wrote it down in the time of, initially, in the time of, of Muhammad, during his lifetime. And they admit this. So it's very good to study from that side of things how you look at the Bible. It could be the Bhagavad Gita, for example, or the Buddhist Pali's, whatever the scripture may be, every single scripture, without doubt, and they will even admit it themselves, has, a, has men who have come in and added and removed and written hundreds of years after Buddha or after Jesus or whoever they or all the, the Indian princes and kings who passed away and they made them into gods and like the ancient Romans. So it's very good to focus on that, that the Quran hasn't changed and it's a promise from Allah that the Quran won't change and it's also, you can mention, that the Quran is the only, also the only book in history that has been able to be memorized by hundreds and thousands of people. You may find the Bible or the other scriptures where a few individuals of very high intellect have been able to memorize the scriptures, but not the average person, whereas the Quran is the only religious scripture where all walks of life, wherever they're from, they could be from Europe, they could be from China, they don't know Arabic, but so many of them have memorized the Quran. And this itself is one of the ways that Allah has preserved this Quran, and this is one of the miracles. So it's very good to focus on those kind of things rather than to try and find verses in the Bible to prove that Islam is right, because we have the Quran for that. Now, there's different ways uh, of giving da'wah. One very good way, really, is you yourself, the way you are as a Muslim. Now, if you're walking around like a gangster rapper, for example, and then you're saying to the person, follow, follow Islam, and you're looking like 50 cent or or some other get gangster rapper, it's not really good. They're going to think to themselves, and this guy is probably going to be too religious, but he looks like that guy who does all kinds of, you know, bad things. So, the external aspect is very important. To represent Islam and to look like a Muslim, to distinguish yourself, is very important. But more important than that, really, is the internal aspect. As we touched on earlier, the whole, the whole manners, the whole way you act. If the people see the way you act, that itself can be a guidance. For example, as I touched upon in the beginning, how I became a Muslim, even though they weren't very practicing Muslims, those Muslims at that time were doing an, an external act of worship, acting like Muslims. I was walking past a classroom, saw them doing that. So that was, that was a form of da'wah. They were acting like Muslims. I saw that and that's what sparked the, the interest in Islam. So that is very important that, you know, we ourselves have good character, have good morals, and will behave like we should as Muslims. And there's many hadith that we, we can, you, can, you can look that up. Eh? There's many books on the best manners in Islam, by the al for example. There's many books you can find regarding the Muslim manners. So if we try to stick to those manners, people will notice that. And we see from the history of Islam, outside of Arabia, the Far East, lots of the countries outside of Arabia, such as you know, Indonesia and parts of China and the Philippines before, all these countries, Islam was not spread like the media propaganda that you know, guys went over there on horses and camels with swords and killed everybody and made them become Muslim. You'll find that they were allowed to enter those countries for the purpose of business and through their good morals and manners, the way they were honest in their business transactions, the way that they would go and give food to their neighbours and their neighbours would be very surprised and they would explain this is what Prophet Muhammad taught us, this is what our religion taught us, that Islam started to spread in those countries like a wildfire. And that is how most of those countries, most of the countries in the world became Muslim. Very few of them, you'll find, historically, came from the, came from the military expeditions and the sword, as everyone puts it. Another way is, for every, anybody you're familiar with, anyone you have some kind of relation with, some kind of rapport, start some kind of dialogue with them very simple dialogue, try to start a conversation and through that way you can you can bring the Tao in via that way. I want to ask you one question actually. How many of you have cars? How many of you drive cars? Give me a show of hands, make it exciting. Only one person has a car? Okay, okay somebody must at least travel in a car with somebody. What I was going to emphasize on is you will find when you go through a petrol petrol station, 
So it's a very simple and very effective way to give dawah, and you could be giving this dawah so many people a day without even realizing it. When you're driving to that petrol station, the guy who's putting your petrol in your he's either most likely either from Nepal or from the Philippines. <laughs> Put in your car, in your glove compartment of your car, 15 books in the Tagalog, the Filipino language, 15 in the Nepali language. The guy comes to pick up, seriously, the guy puts the petrol. How easy is that? Doesn't require braveness, doesn't require extreme knowledge. You just open that glove compartment. You're from Nepal, yes. Here you go, take this book. And I know a very active uh, guy, he works with me, his name is Brother Isa, he's from the Philippines, and he works with me at Al-Siraj, the Islamic exhibition, Dubai government Islamic exhibition I mentioned earlier. And that's how he became Muslim. Someone just handed him over, simple as that, they handed him over a book in the Filipino language, Tagalog, about Islam. And now he is one of the most active Filipino guys in the whole of the Emirates. In the last 10 years, hundreds, maybe even a thousand people have become Muslim. I personally witnessed through our work, maybe 60, 70 Filipinos become Muslim through his dawah. And how did he start? By one average Muslim handing him that book. So that's, and all those drive throughs you go through, when you go and get your Baskin Robbins and your Dunkin' Donuts and your McDonald's drive through again, most of them are Filipinos. Take those books, have those books ready available and give them to them. And that is a very effective way of giving dawah. And who knows how many people will become Muslim from that. And especially, with those kind of communities, they are very acceptable to Islam. They have a lot of, inshallah, from what I've seen, they have a lot of natural goodness in them. They have this general love of being religious, but they just need the right message. And many of them, once you explain topic to them, from the Filipino community, for example, they become Muslim. So it's a very effective way to give them da'wah, since they're a very large community here in the UAE. And uh, another thing is, volunteering with organizations. I'm kind of promoting the exhibition now. But volunteering with Islamic organizations, no matter what you do, you could be somebody who's involved in some kind of conference, you could be handing out water, but just you handing out that water, you will get the reward, the same as the other people who are doing more active roles, because it's, a, it's an overall uh, effort. If one or two fall out of this effort, the whole conference or the whole dawah effort collapses. So no matter, whatever you have a skill, whatever you can do, you can volunteer with these organizations, like I mentioned before, our exhibition in the Shundala area, Dubai Government Department of Tourism, Al Siraj, we have a very, we have, for example, dawah programs. Well, we were open every day, but we get very busy doing the Dubai shopping festival. So we're always looking for brothers and sisters to be involved in this, because we like to call it dawah to the world. We as individuals cannot go around the world giving dawah, but when you go to a place like our exhibition, every nationality, pretty much comes into that exhibition. So you get to spread the message of Islam to the world in that sense. Because so many nationalities come through there. So that's a very good way to get involved in Dawa through such organizations. And really that's all I have to say to that. I hope it's, uh, I apologize for any uh, shortcomings on my side. Any mistakes uh, from me and the Shaitan. Apologize if I wasn't that exciting, but I'm doing that.